All right, um, let's move on to the uh, second uh, plenary uh, talk today, the uh, SBE uh, plenary by uh, another very distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Yan Chen from both the US and China. Professor Yan Chen is the Vincent uh, P. Whaley Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue University, USA, and the Chanjian Chair Professor at Tianjin University, China. He serves as the Editor-in-Chief of the journal Building and Environment. His current research topics include indoor environment, aircraft, cabin environments, and energy efficient, healthy, and sustainable building design and analysis. He has received a total funding exceeding US $32 million. He has also published two books and more than 320 journal and conference papers, and he has been invited to deliver more than 130 lectures internationally. Professor Chen received the Distinguished Service Award from International Building Performance Simulation Association, the Overseas Chinese Contribution Award from All China Federation of Returned Overseas, the John Rybert Gold Medal from the Scandinavian Federation of Heating, Ventilating and Sanitary Engineering Associations the Willis J. Whitefield Award from the Institute of Environmental Sciences and Technology, the Korea Award from the U.S. National Science Foundation, and several technical paper and poster awards, and Distinguished and Exceptional Service Award from ASHE. He is also a fellow of the ASHE and ISIAQ. His topic today is Inverse Designs of Enclosed Environments, how far are we there? Let's give a big hand to uh, Professor Chen. Uh, thank you very much. Well, first I'd like to thank uh, Yogo Lee for the invitation. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. And Yogo also asked me to um, talk something about the inverse design. I know it's um, a pretty uh, strange topic for many of you. Even yesterday, Matt Sandberg asked me what the inverse design means. Well, that's really a challenge to me because uh, even myself, we just started a couple of years ago. So I try to uh, give you some basic idea about this um, uh, topic. So the, this is my um, outline today. Um, why we care about uh, inverse design? First, we have to look at um, uh, where are we now. You know, we are all indoors. I mean, this morning when we took the bus and then go to the basement, we didn't go outside. So if you look at how, many, uh, how much time you spend each day, and definitely those uh, pictures are uh, very familiar to you. So we spend all most 90% of the time indoors, and that's why we care about the indoor air. So we need to do the study. Uh, in order to maintain a comfortable uh, indoor environment, we spend a lot of money for it. For example, in terms of energy, in the USA, we spend about 41% of the total energy. Then um, look at the 41% of energy in buildings, of course, um, there's still uh, some energy was used for lighting, etc. But you look for cooling, heating, and also ventilation here, you see this is uh, quite uh, a large amount. So we spend so much money, we spend so much resources, then we must get a, a very good indoor air. But you know, we do the work, we are still not satisfied with the indoor air. So this is a study did by Bill Fisk a couple of years ago. He calculated the impact of the productivity loss in the US um, uh, office buildings. It range have, could be as high as $200 billion per year. And this is a huge amount of money 
And therefore, we still uh, have to say our mission has not been complete. We still need to work harder. Now, look at um, uh, my interest in the inverse design, in fact, was uh, starting with the problems of uh, infectious disease transmission. And this is also a part of uh, indoor air problems. I mean, yesterday, uh, people show a lot of work from Yogo about the um, SARS problems in here in Hong Kong. And I want to remind you, this is a reply uh, of uh, Air China 112 from Hong Kong to Beijing in 2003. There was a super infected here. He infected about uh, 20 something people in the plane, as you can see from those dark uh, dots. And unfortunately, four of them died. So this was the beginning of my interest, you know, to look at why cannot we identify this guy before he was on board. Or if he, is, he was on board, can we really figure it out before he uh, landed uh, in Beijing? So maybe we can isolate him somewhere in the sky. So that was my interest. And of course, this type of problem always come on and off all the time. In 2009, as you can see, this was um, um, the problems of H1N1 influenza. And therefore, we needed to find out what's the best way to solve such a problem. Now, if we look at the uh, indoor uh, environment design, of course, it's not new to us. In 1800s, there was a poison problem. That's why I start with the ventilation. In 1900, it was a continuous disease. There was another H1N1 problem in 1905. That's a so-called Spanish flu killed about 15 million people. So when we look at the air conditioning, that was really in the last century, in the beginning, was not really a big uh, hit. And people was afraid of air conditioning. Now, of course, we have to rely on air conditioning. We feel very comfortable in this um, uh, green hole here. And we are not only satisfied with the thermal comfort. We look at the uh, indoor air quality, the health, the productivity. Now, what will happen in 20 or 30 years from now? So we really want to design some type of uh, indoor environment. Even like uh, us, we sit so close to each other. If someone is coughing, sneezing next to you, you should not be afraid of that. Can we do it? That's really the challenge. So if we want to design something, we should really can meet the such a uh, requirement that should be personalized. So somebody prefer to have a temperature like a 30 degree, and someone might want to have like a 15 degree. Can we do that just in, in next to each other? And it will be also needed to be very healthy, secure, comfortable, and productive. And also, we want to achieve such a goal without paying too much. So that means we don't want to use a lot of energy to do this, and that's the challenge. But if we look at those objectives, then of course this deal with a lot of micro environment, and we want to get as low concentration as possible of whatever chemicals or the biological stuff, right? Most of us are doing here in this indoor air conference, and of course, the security uh, often is very similar to the health issue, just to try to minimize the concentration. And then for the thermal comfort, it will look at the right temperature, humidity, and turbulence, et cetera. So if you look at all those uh, parameters, then we find this is uh, somehow related to flu mechanics problem. That's why this morning when Professor Peter Nielsen talked about why we needed to do the uh, calculation, try to use this tool of CFD to do the design. Okay, now let's look at how we are doing design today. So I take the airplane as an example because the airplane is really a uh, very populated uh, place to be. And most of our design start with the trial and errors. That means we know airplane, you know, is a tube of aluminum, and then there's diffusers there, 
and we try to look at this uh, geometry, which is very complex with a lot of um, uh, very complex diffusers inside. And of course, we should will lead to the flow, heat transfer, contaminant transfer inside. And we use the CFD, for example, to calculate the velocity, temperature, humidity, etc., and then finally compare with our design objective. It's less thermally comfortable. It's less um, uh, air quality uh, okay, and how much energy you spend. So uh, Boeing make this uh, dream airliner because it is more energy efficient. Therefore, their sale is pretty good. So you look at this type of design process. Of course, one time you find that, well, I did not meet the thermal comfort. I change something, and then I do it again and again. And this is a very complex problem because we have uh, to deal uh, with the multiple scales, uh, ranging very small diffusers to very big airplanes. And there's a lot of uh, physics involved. And if you want to do this uh, calculation over and over again, as you see from uh, Peter's uh, lecture, it took a lot of uh, effort to do it. Now the question is, uh, can we do the inverse design? So I start with the list of objectives, and then to look at what the airplane shape inside should be. So this is the inverse design. OK, now before I talk about the inverse design, I want to talk about reverse engineering. Reverse engineering will help me to introduce this inverse design. Uh, for example, we use this airplane to do the research. This airplane was an MD-82 plane uh, designed in 1970. So when we got the plane, we wanted to find out the geometry. We don't have that. We asked Boeing. Boeing said, well, it took them two years to get it. Then we uh, look at uh, just the inside of the university. And that's a group of people, they do the reverse engineering. They say, oh, we can do it in a couple of days. So they use this Leica uh, camera. And as you can see, they have a global control port and use laser trackers, which can quickly generate a lot of cloud. Those are the data of the geometry of this airplane. And uh, very soon, we can use this uh, information to build up the fuselage and different parts. And then you assemble all them together. And that's the model we want. So the total process here is only took us about four days to get everything. Compared with the forward engineering, we asked uh, the manufacturer to do it. And this is really big uh, time saving. So this mature, I mean, method is very mature. Now the question is, uh, uh, can we do this for indoor environment? Not only the geometry, but the air. And of course, um, we look at the solutions. Uh, typically, we will think that you have the input, and then you have a system, you get the output, right? That's the output is outdoor air. But immersive engineering, uh, would it, Reverse engineering is really just going opposite. You know, you might know the output and try to find the input, or I might know the output and input and want to find out the system parameters. So I give you a few examples. The first example is a heat transfer. They start much earlier than us. So typically, they might uh, know what the heat transfer on one side of a wall and the wall property and try to find out what's the lead boundary condition on the other side. So it's being used for heat transfer a lot. It's a lot successful. Another application is about the op optimal design of geometry. For example, this is an airplane wing. The original design might not be uh, very efficient. The drug can be high. So you could use reverse engineering together with the CFD and then you get the final design. Uh, it looks a little bit different from the original design, which can minimize the uh, drag. And also, the other type of applications, for example, uh, underground water pollution is very typical uh, in mainland of China. And most cases, you can only drill, uh, drill a, a few holes in the ground. And then you could measure what type of pollution is there. Then you need to identify where the source is. 
So that's uh, uh, why in the hydrology field, they use the information here to identify the source. So this is uh, the reverse engineering. So when we saw this example, we said, well, this is very similar to the airplane from Hong Kong to Beijing. That's why we try to identify where the source is. So let's look at the uh, indoor environment uh, uh, application. So the first one, we look at very simple uh, two-dimensional application. You know, this is, uh, is a, a, a cabin two-dimensionally without a seat, okay? And I imagine that uh, probably I put a source on the ground. Can we identify that source? So I start with something uh, pretty simple, for example, by using CFD to get the uh, concentration distribution. And now, can I just uh, solve the Navier-Stokes equation universally to get the result? And this is Navier-Stokes equation Peter just uh, showed us. And unfortunately, you cannot really solve this equation universally because the diffusion term here is not uh, reversible. You, uh, just like entropy is always increasing, you cannot make the entropy smaller. So we have to twist the equation a little bit by changing this second order term into the fourth order. Then we can do the job. So I start with this initial field by using CFD. Now I want to find out the uh, source. Now here is the result. As you can see, now it's going backwards. And this is the final result. Well, it's a repeatedly animation. As you can see, I don't really get just a single source here. You see, the final result is rather diversive, right? You, you can see it's a pretty large area. But at least I can identify the position. And this is a very simple two-dimensional case, and of course, it's not very realistic. Then we say, well, airflow in the cabin is really going like circles. Can we try a little bit more complicated? So the second example I want to try here is uh, uh, with the two circles. And you probably uh, can see the final result is a little bit more uh, uh, diverse. So probably this uh, slice is a little bit better. So this is originally on the, with uh, one circulation. We find the source is here. And this is the second case uh, you see it getting a little bit um, uh, more uh, dispersive here. But at least we can identify the position, so it's encouraging. And then uh, we try to apply this into a cabin. So this is a, a uh, twin IO cabin uh, with nine seats, uh, seven seats on a row. Suppose we have a sensor here, which will sense, for example, SARS uh, virus. And suppose this is um, uh, real-time sensor, and we can calculate it back. Okay, you see this red one is identified as source. The real source is here, so we come pretty close, just within half a C. So this was uh, pretty exciting to us. And recently, um, the application uh, from uh, Professor Zhang in uh, Darling University, they could also try this uh, for a particular source. And the original source is here, and you try to, you see the time is re reversible, and you see the identified source could be in this area. So it's not only for the gaseous phase, particulate can also be traced back. And if we try to use this for a, a room, this is three-dimensional, and I have sensors here, and somebody was coughing or sneezing here, and suppose the sensor measure something is more interesting, not like the one I show, you know, pretty uh, simple one. So it could be literally sensor measure something like a cough, right? You have peak, et cetera. So suppose I know the source uh, position here, then I will be able to identify how the source really looks like. So as you, you can see here, the actual source is black line, and the inverse of the uh, result is a red line here. They are close enough. So, but unfortunately, all this here, uh, the result I show here, I must know where the source should be. And this is a, uh, a inverse 
identification of the source. And it's not really try to find out where I should have a diffuser, et cetera. So this type of application has a, a lot of limitation. And that's why we need to find a better method and this better method I call is a forward method. It's not just try to solve a novice toxic equation backwards. We use a different technology. So then I need to define what are our objective. You know, our objective, for example, in this conference room or your office, you sit here and you just want to have a very gentle air, you know, going through um, your back and you want to have a very clean air, for example, the edge of the air in your nose position, maybe just uh, two minutes. Now, where the diffuser should be? It will be in this position or in that position or somewhere else. And that's our design objective. So in order to do this, we need to first to start with the design objective, that's the comfort, quality, air quality, and also uh, with the energy. And our design variables are really the inlet air condition, location, and the size, and trigger maybe also the wall temperature. Because if you really want to be comfortable, you have to control the temperature as well. So uh, we start to define an objective function by using the uh, predicted mean volt, which is a function of velocity and temperature. For air quality, I use the age of air. And I integrate this equation with this design domain, which can be like this lecture hall. And my job is to minimize this one, okay? You try to get the PMV equal to zero, that is the best for thermal comfort. You get the age of air to zero, that means 100% fresh air. So that's our uh, object function. So this uh, just like uh, when you try to uh, shoot a basketball. First you try that, it didn't get into the basket. And then you measure, oh, I missed this uh, objective by the distance of L. And then you adjust the initial velocity and uh, suppose the angle is right. So what do you do here? You adjust the uh, velocity, then you finally can shoot it. So this really look like I start with somewhere here. It's not really uh, go to the, the basket. And therefore, you look at the gradient. OK, so you update, the uh, change the uh, velocity. And then finally, you get to the goal. So this is the so-called adjoint method. It's a very uh, important method for the forward simulation of inverted design. But this one, you have to start with the right place. For example, I start here, I can get the optimal one. If I start from here, I can only get to here. Because when you reach to that point, you go further, there will be a positive gradient. Then you cannot really get to the solution. So this type of method, in fact, is not very new. It start to appear uh, very similar to CFD a long time ago. But it was not applied uh, to um, the flow in the indoor building until recently. As you can see the history here, most of the applications was outside of our field. But now it really becomes very popular. And I want to show you some more examples here. For example, if you have a diffuser, originally we typically def uh, design a diffuser like that. And you ever measure the velocity from the diffuser, the velocity is not uniform. So how could you make a diffuser produce a very uniform velocity? You can use the method, and then you see this is the final design with a very uniform uh, velocity here. And the, the, uh, your pipe looks very strange. You never see such a pipe probably in your life. And let's say it can only be produced with the inverse modeling. So let's say the final result is really the pipe shape. And this takes a, just about 20 iterations to do it automatically. You don't have to intervene in between. So we also can look at the, uh, for example, in buildings, uh, this is a, a case and like Peter just showed, very simple uh, box. You have inlet there, outlet there. And I look at, for example, Along this, uh, a few dots here, 
I want exactly the same velocity and temperature as a measured one. Then can I get the inlet velocity? And I start with something, for example, um, initial velocity can be anything, initial temperature can be anything. I really want to make sure this is objective, that means uh, my velocity temperature should be exactly like a measured one. So I start with the inlet somewhere here, and then you see this is an automatic process, at the end it's finished with the inlet is on the top. But not exactly, you see my final result or inlet will be here, and the real one is really on the top. So it's close, but not exactly the same. But inverse modeling is possible. Then you might say, well, that case was too simple. How about we use a much more complex case? And this case, I see, you can see here is a, a half cabin, just one row, first class. And my design objective in this case is to make sure my P and V is equal to zero. All right, so thermally uh, comfortable. And the thermal comfort is not on your feet or your head. I want to design a space. Uh, you see this pink uh, area is uh, around the you, entire area to be comfortable. So we start with the conventional wisdom. And conventional wisdom, uh, as you well, I can see initial, you probably see uh, some indication here. Uh, start with the initial condition is red. As you can see, PMV is not uh, well, very good, 0 0.5. Let's current design, even you sit in the first class, you don't really feel it's very comfortable. But then we can change it. You see the color becomes uh, uh, yellow, green, and then finally uh, blue, you know, this is uh, to zero, it should be green. So you see the final design, optimal design, is more or less green. And what we do here is really just to change the supply velocity and temperature. And this uh, final velocity and temperature and mm -hmm. supplying angle is automatically calculated with this uh, method. But this method takes a lot of uh, computing time as well and we can only find the local optimal, in not the real uh, op optimal design. And therefore, a different type of method, so-called the genetic algorithm. So this one is start with the, um, the, I mean, the technology start in the 1990s. So the method is pretty simple. You produce a, a certain type of samples, and then you could really select what the best. We call the first selection. Um, in the uh, ZA method, they look at the fitness number. And if it's not very ideal, then you uh, cross this over and do the mutation, and then you generate a uh, new population. So that means you select uh, by iteration, and each time you select, you generate a better and better result. And finally, you might end your final results is there. So this is, a, again, is a forward simulation. But you start with a different uh, initial population, and finally just to identify which one is the best. So the application of this method uh, has been in different type of uh, field. And uh, uh, I, I just use this example, it's a, a duct. For example, in the original design, the velocity and temperature distribution is not the uniform. Then when you use uh, the inverse uh, modeling by the GA method, and the final result, you can see this is the velocity distribution, less the temperature distribution they are much more uniform. So let's say it's a, a, a pretty good result. And again, we try to uh, use this one just uh, for um, the case, uh, as you see here, there's an inlet, the people there, outlet. So we find that this result, in fact, uh, has uh, multiple solutions. 
So if my objective here, again, is to define the PMV around the person to be as small as possible, and how small, for example, PMV equal to 0 0.2, then we find the solution is multiple. For example, your temperature, let's say temperature, let's say velocity, and let's say supplying angle. Suppose my inlet is fixed. So you see this surface here, along this surface, okay, this colored surface, all satisfy my PMV uh, definition. So that means, for example, I might use uh, a supply temperature of uh, 10 degree and velocity of one meter per second and then the angle about 10 de uh, degree. I could uh, achieve that uh, PMV. So if I again apply this one to the air cabin, and this time I make it it's a much more relaxed. For example, I do not say the inlet must be here. Inlet can be on the ground, it can be anywhere. And then I uh, start to do the simulation. And then as you can see, during the optimization, your inlet and outlet location varies. And of course, some of the solutions are impossible. If you want to have the inlet on this cheek area, you know, that's outside of an airplane, that's impossible. But finally, we could identify the inlet will be, the best will be on the floor level and the outlet is on the um, upper right corner. In fact, this means that now our plane should be designed in an opposite way and your result also opposite. And that will be uh, better uh, for the uh, comfort. For example, our design objective in this case is very uh, optimal and it's uh, achievable. So if I compare the two methods I just mentioned, as you can see here, the genetic organism method needs a lot of cases, uh, initial cases in order to define, uh, identify the best one. The GA method, uh, adjoint method we only need about 40% of the GA method, and you can identify one, but this one may be just a local optimal, not the overall optimal. And that's why in a lot of applications in immersion modeling, they try to combine. Because this one is faster, this one you can look at the overall optimal. So that's um, the uh, starting point. And another application is um, the use of so-called proper organophile uh, decom uh, decomposition method or POD method. This one is uh, much simpler. You know, for example, you might start with uh, a number of different cases and you are not trying to produce a lot of cases, but you try to, uh, identify what is the main characters of those cases, which means you get the main character, like a dash line there. And with that one, you can really get the result much faster. So let's show you, uh, let me show you uh, this example. The real PMV, uh, PIV measurement of a jet flow really look like this. So if I only use uh, five uh, basic cases to identify this PIV, and the, uh, this POD method will get a, a flow like that. Of course, this one show the main character of that one, but not exactly the same. So if I increase the, the case from five to 50, you see that it's uh, much better. And if you could increase to 100, and then they are more or less the same. So we could also apply the same method for design of this cabin. So if I look at the uh, first, the percentage of dissatisfied due to draft, and then you will find that your opening, this is an opening size, can be very big. You know, sometimes it's unrealistic big. Uh, four centimeter, you don't see that the big uh, diffuser in the airplane. Then the second one, I just look at, well, if I could design PMV to be, uh, very small, then you find that, well, it should be as small as possible. Then you get like a, something like that. Then the third one, I look at the age of air, and this is the age of air design. It will be somewhere 
also again the small one. Then the overall objective is to satisfy all the three uh, design goals, and that means your result will be only in this uh, small range. And that's uh, the, uh, the final design. And it's a P uh, POD method, of course, uh, is uh, much faster because uh, you do not have to calculate a lot of cases and you can pro, uh, be faster. And this is not uh, all. You know, a lot of applications try to combine different type of methods together. For example, if I could combine GA and the uh, adjoint method, and if you have a lot of design variables, your computing speed will be reduced. You have 10 more minutes. Thank you very much. And um, this is uh, one application. You know, you could uh, combine with GA, with the POD, and this original design, this final design. Probably you don't see a lot of difference, but definitely you uh, see the CO2 concentration in the optimal design is lower, and PMV also is lower. And you can combine with other methods, for example, ANN, or so-called artificial neural network model, etc. And we uh, use this one to, uh, to do the cabin design. We can dramatically reduce the case number. For example, originally, we might need about 350 case, and now the new one just need up to 100 cases. But that's not uh, good enough. Why? Because uh, in a lot of uh, applications, we use the CFD to do the design. And Peter already mentioned CFD is very expensive. And we calculate 300 cases of CFD, it's already a couple of months. Although you might get an optimal design, and that might be good if your design is very slow. For example, uh, in the US, you design a building take a year or two. But if you look in China, to design a building just take a month or two, then of course you cannot use the tool. You need to have something very fast. And that's why we look at the so-called fast fluid dynamics. Fast fluid dynamics, you solve the equation just like now it stocks equation. But the algorithm is a little bit different. You solve the term by term. And this is just a different algorithm which is much faster. So to do that, I want to show you in real time this um, uh, FFD simulation. So this is the case you see Peter just mentioned, this inlet there, outlet there, okay? Two-dimensional, pretty simple. And I'm going to do this uh, real-time uh, real simulation. Well, this computer is very fast. It's two-dimensional. As you see, this speed is 110 times faster than real-time. So if I do in a third dimension by using 110 uh, grid, I will do real time, okay? So this is a uh, velocity simulation, you know, look like real. If you don't believe, for example, I click here, give a, a momentum source, you see it changes, right? And then I can also um, change, for example, by inject a smoke here. Well, you see, smoke is diluted because this is 110 times faster, and therefore smoke is diluted very fast. So this is a very good technology we could use. And this result also is not bad. Uh, I show you here, this is look like a, a very simple two-person office, and we measure the temperature and concentration. Uh, those uh, measure data are in samples. And the lines, uh, one uh, dash line is a CFD, and the solid line is a FFD. They are compatible uh, results. But that's uh, fast, but not fast enough if I wanted to do real-time design. And therefore, we needed to find also other solutions uh, through computer. And I call um, the computer technology. You know, all the guys like me, when we, we buy computers, I always look at the machine clock uh, time. That's the CPU frequency. 
And it's a lot of frustrating, you know, in the past 10 years, this uh, frequency no longer increasing. And now for young generations, for many of you, you probably buy computers, you never look at the machine uh, frequency, right? What you look at is uh, the C, uh, GPU card or graphic card. So graphic cards really contains a lot of CPU. They don't work very hard, but let's say a lot of people work together. And that makes a huge difference. So we now run our FFD on GPU rather on CPU. So here is the result. If you do the CFD calculation, this is the number of grid you use. Peter mentioned about the 8 million, there will be somewhere there, right? If you do the CFD calculation, you see you need to wait for a couple of days to get the result. By doing the FFD on CPU, we might get up to 50 times faster. That's what you see today, I run this on CPU. And if I do on GPU, because it's a parallel processing, when your grid number is small, your computing time is not faster. In fact, it can be very slow. But if you use a lot of grid, then your speed runs up. And if you could optimize that, you can get up to 30 times faster. So you compare with the CFD and FFD on GPU can be 1,500 times faster. So I could imagine for this um, gray hall, I can run full time, I mean real time uh, FFD simulation. So to conclude, um, I think the CFD based inverse method are being used for different type of engineering field. And it could also be used for the indoor environment design. The backward uh, waters method, uh, I show you to identify the sources, et cetera. They are pretty good, but not very good for the indoor environment design. So if you wanted to get a better thermal comfort, better air quality, you have to use the forward uh, method. So forward method is very promising for the immersive design of the indoor environment. And we uh, use uh, different methods here. The adjoint method is uh, fast, but it can only identify the local optimal uh, result. The genetic organism can find the uh, overall or global design, but the computing effort is um, uh, much more significant. The POD method, uh, it's uh, much faster, and this uh, computing uh, speed is um, uh, just within uh, a few hours, but the accuracy is normally a little bit poorer. So the combination of two or more methods becomes a trend in this field, and it's been uh, studied a lot in the recent days. And F FD could be used to replace the CFD for inverse design. And only when you do the final check, you probably can apply the CFD again. So finally, I'd like to thank uh, the, a lot of my uh, current and former colleagues for their contribution into uh, this presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Professor Chen, uh, introducing us to the world of uh, use of uh, inverse method in uh, solving a number of uh, very practical uh, applications. Um, so he introduced us uh, different methods, including a uh, backward method and also uh, forward method. And uh, the usage is not only in indoor air quality, but also in other aspects of engineering design, including uh, identification of uh, pollutant sources, shape optimization, etc. I'm sure that most of our audience can benefit a lot from his talk. So thank you so much, Professor Chen. Let's give him one more round of applause. So um, I am here to officially announce the uh, end of uh, this uh, plenary uh, section number one. Uh, but before we leave, I know that our uh, chairman would like to uh, say a few words, uh, Professor Lee. Thank you. Uh, I wish I have a reverse inverse method. 
so that I don't have the queue problem from last night. Anyway, we still have two challenges. I'd like to make a, a three announcements. First, uh, you know this is a 3D campus. To find the rooms uh, uh, for the conference will not be so easy. Actually, we use 11 rooms on four stories. This is lower ground, ground, first, second, and third. We try to use less, but eventually the university don't, not allow me. So sorry, guys, you have to run up and down. And there will be signage. So and page 26 is the overall program of the conference. After the next session, next challenge is for lunch. On the university campus, actually we handle about 10,000 students. However, the difference here, we are all new. So um, go as far as possible from this grand hall if you to try to avoid the queue for your lunch. Because there are 13 restaurants, the coupon can be used. One problem with the coupon is that the, the, the restaurant will take whatever we, we, we write down on a coupon. So we wrote down 35 Hong Kong dollars. If you order more, you may need to use cash. So just a bit of warning. If you, another way to avoid the queue for lunch, you can join AGM of EasyAC. EasyAC AGM will be starting immediately after session 12.30 at room one, which is the LG 08, actually opposite of this grand hall. 80 sandwiches will be ordered, but late arrivals will have to find a lunch uh, 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 somewhere in the restaurant. Thank you very much.